It's a pleasure to uh, be here, to be able to speak to you. And, and uh, as the slide says, I'm going to speak about natural language processing and start with a very general perspective uh, of the field as I see it. Um, then spend a little time speaking about the Israeli landscape, which is a very small country, but a very active uh, theme. And then spend time on uh, the company I'm uh, most involved with called AI21 Labs. So let's get going. Uh, the starting point is uh, just a broad view of modern day AI, clearly uh, with deep learning, ushered the new era and at heart what deep learning is, is pattern detection, pattern recognition done at a mega scale uh, and uh, with uh, amazing uh, potential applications that we're familiar with. When you couple uh, deep learning with reinforcement learning, you uh, get deep reinforcement learning and then you can start to not just detect patterns but automate action and maybe the poster child application for that is autonomous vehicles uh, what is clearly has happened in the last two years that uh, of course these areas have continued to flourish but deep language models have come to the fore and um, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking much about that but the way i look at it is if Machine vision has been where reinforcement learning and in particular deep learning ha have had the most impact. It's sort of a lens into the eye. Uh, language is a lens into the mind, and it's more complicated and much harder, but if you bring value there, it opens up very exciting possibilities. So speaking about language, uh, the last two years have really seen something of a revolution, and clearly what has ushered that revolution are um, the deep language models, and we'll be speaking more about them, but primarily the contextual models, uh, such as BERT from Google and GPT from OpenAI. And, um, and if you look, for example, at academic benchmarks uh, that uh, try to capture how well the technology is performing, for example, the question answering uh, data set squad from Stanford, or superglue, which is an amalgamation of a number of different uh, benchmarks. Uh, the, all the performance on all of those has dramatically improved due to these deep language models. Um, and uh, that's true in the understanding part of things. You see similarly uh, very uh, dramatic demonstrations, at least, of uh, capabilities in language generation and of course, in recent months, GPT-3 has captured the imagination uh, of many people. Uh, understanding has um, rather clear benchmarks, although those are two are open to uh, some clear benchmarks, although those are two are open to uh, some debate, and we'll be talking about that. Generation doesn't have quite the benchmarks, but more of a demonstration that can be very impressive. If you look at understanding, uh, so for example, look at squad, and you see that, that uh, indeed uh, the uh, performance increased steadily until it reached human level performance sometime in 2017. And um, you have many such examples. Uh, we don't have time to go into them, but the Winograd schemas, the word in context uh, sort of competition or challenge, uh, ProPara, another data set. And in all cases, what you see is at the beginning, performance lags human performance rather dramatically. Uh, these are the examples. Uh, and then very quickly, on the order of not many months, uh, suddenly the performance uh, increases dramatically, uh, approaching in some cases, not here, but in some cases, uh, reaching human level performance. So that would seem to be uh, very good news. And it is, uh, the progress is very, very significant, and nothing I say should be interpreted as suggesting otherwise. However, uh, we do need to uh, take uh, um, uh, a little, uh, to be a little modest about the progress. Uh, because if we don't, we will be disappointed and there'll be a negative backlash. Already at the beginning, uh, when uh, this squad was quote unquote solved, 
um, Jian Liang came out with a paper that suggested we need to be careful that it's, things are a little brittle here. This is an example of, so how does squad work? You give it a paragraph, such as the paragraph you see here, and you give it a question, such as that one here. What is the name of the quarterback who was 38 in Super Bowl 33? And what you want is to find the span in the text where the answer lies. In this case, the answer is John Elway. But what they showed that when you put uh, just a little bit of irrelevant information, a distractor, for example, you add a sentence that says quarterback Jeff Dean and so on, uh, that has nothing to do uh, with the question at hand, the answer becomes the wrong answer. And in general, the F score is a standard measure of the performance on these, uh, on these test sets uh, drops dramatically. So that was an early warning sign. Uh, more recently, uh, there was a very interesting paper, which I think the title uh, is very, um, uh, very appropriate, uh, right for the wrong reasons, meaning that the, we're succeeding, but not for the right reasons, and therefore we need to be a little cautious by Tal Linsen and his uh, colleagues. And uh, what they hypothesize is that in all those data sets, uh, for example, in textual entailment, meaning that uh, you give a, a sentence and another sentence and you ask whether the first sentence entails the last, the second sentence, that even when you perform well, what really is happening is that the system is latching onto very surface uh, phenomena uh, and uh, not really understanding things and therefore wouldn't perform well um, in other cases. In this case, all very low level lexical things, for example, that the uh, premise, the first sentence, includes, or sorry, in this case, overlaps uh, the second sentence. And so they hypothesized that three heuristics explain much of what the system was doing. What they constructed was an interesting data set uh, where um, the one or more of these heuristics always held in each of the pairs of uh, examples, but in half of them, entailment held between the two sentences and in half not. And they showed essentially that in all of the cases in which tailment held the systems, all the leading systems at the time, predicted well that entailment would hold. And in all the other cases where entailment didn't hold, the system still predicted that the uh, entailment holds. In other words, they validated the assumption that the system is simply looking at, uh, uh, at these surface phenomena. What this is telling us is that we should take these successes with a certain grain of salt, that solutions are fragile, we're sort of overfitting to the data, and if you go out of domain, or out of sample, performance will likely drop significantly. Um, let's now speak, think about language generation. And, uh, and again, GPT-3 is uh, very much in use today. And they are very impressive systems uh, and bring a lot of value. Um, and the way they work, I think it's well known. This is from GPT-2. Uh, you put an initial segment, for example, a sentence, artificial intelligence is the art of science of enabling machines and so on. And the system continues. So segment, for example, a sentence, artificial intelligence is the art of science of enabling machines and so on. And the system continues uh, to generate um, a, a, a story, whether it's a paragraph or, or more. Uh, and I won't read this, but this happens to be a very nice paragraph. And the point is, getting a nice paragraph is more the exception than the rule. We have to recognize that. And here's a more typical example. Tech generation technologies today show great signs of uh, progress, as evidenced by GPT-2, Grover, and Heim. And you continue, and it starts more or less okay. Both of these technologies, both already is wrong because we have three, but never mind. They generate code that doesn't alter existing application in a meaningful, useful manner, and maybe, but then it totally goes off track. Uh, it speaks about GPT stands for good parts and counterparts and what have you. And so, um, so uh, people have written about this, and here are some of the quotes. Um, uh, from people who, who know this area. Um, and I think all the people, uh, certainly like myself, 
uh, see the value in this tech generation system, but also uh, warn you that uh, they have li significant limitations. I think maybe the second quote here from uh, uh, Tiernan Ray at ZDNet uh, is a pithy way of capturing it. These systems display flashes of billions mixed with gibberish. Um, I think that's true. Um, so if you want to keep in perspective, um, GPT-3 is a very valuable uh, piece of technology. Let me be clear about this. Um, um, th it's und uh, undisputable, but it has limitations and we're not the only one to say it, uh, OpenAI themselves, uh, because of all the hype, Sam Altman, the CEO, uh, tweeted this to caution so people don't get ahead of themselves. So where all this leads us is that significant progress, but um, but uh, we're really far from the way humans think and use language. This is a reconstruction of the cartoon that I remember from my childhood of a kid looking at the stars through a telescope and standing on a little stool to get closer to the stars. Uh, the stool is current day AI. It's maybe a little insult and inappropriate because I think the progress is very significant and the stool suggests maybe uh, it's not, that's not the intention, but uh, we have a long way to go. So um, when you, where, where do I want to, want to, to go? Um, in some sense, it's very disappointing. We want to get to a point where we have the intelligence and language skills of a five-year-old. Take the sentence, Danny hit me at school, so I hit him back, but the teacher only saw me hitting him, so she punished me, it's not fair. This is really something any kid understands very well. None of our systems begin to understand it in any sense. And when you think about it intuitively, the way we understand it, we understand that there's time. And when you think about it intuitively, the way we understand it, we understand that there's time, there's a the time timeline and there's events in time and there's a temporal but also causal connection between them. There are agents that take action. Uh, we have the agents have beliefs. They have beliefs about other people's beliefs and so on. Um, essentially, we have very rich semantics associated with the language, and this is the sort of thing we need to somehow attain if we want our system to uh, have similar capabilities. And the way I look at, uh, at it is, we have now been in the second phase of AI for uh, at least a decade. The first phase was um, symbolic systems, KR stands for, stands for knowledge representation. And um, we had um, uh, a lot of attention paid to how to represent time and causation and things like that. We didn't have much data, very little compute power the methods were very crude. We then pivoted to the mirror image. We have basically amazing statistics uh, uh, done with neural net networks, huge amount of data, insane compute power, no semantics. And if we really want to get to the age where machines understand things, we need to marry the two. That's how I look at things. And um, I'll get back to that, but I promised to speak a little bit about what happened uh, in Israel, so let me do that. So Israel is a tiny country. Uh, I haven't checked recently, but it's a little over 10 million people now. And, um, and, but it's well known to have a very disproportionate number of uh, both academic and uh, you know, high-tech uh, uh, entities and activities. Uh, you can go to a, a good resource to look at it. It's something called Startup Central Nation. You can look it up. And if you, um, if you um, search for artificial intelligence, you'll have over 400 companies. If you search for natural language, you'll have over 300 co uh, co companies. And of course, I can't uh, do justice to this uh, Brit. So uh, I picked uh, four to speak about. Um, and let me do that. Um, two of them are very applied, uh, very successful, very applied um, in language uh, companies, or, or rather companies that use language technologies, and the other is uh, the other two uh, have a more deep uh, technological uh, focus. 
So Gong uh, was uh, is, is about five five years old. It has three hundred fifty employees. It just raised a two hundred million dollar round at a two point two billion dollar valuation. So obviously it's doing very well. And it started with uh, uh, transcribing uh, sales uh, calls by sales uh, executives, uh, salespeople and doing uh, initially rather simple uh, analysis of the calls and giving insights uh, to the salespeople and the management, seeing what in the sales call works and what moves the needle. They then branched out to not just video calls, but uh, to email, to meeting uh, kind of captures uh, and capture, uh, looking at the systems of record in particular CRM uh, kind of captures uh, and capture, uh, looking at the systems of record in particular CRM. And um, and a part of what they use here are really uh, language technologies to extract sentiment uh, and uh, certain keywords and things like that. Uh, very interesting company, like I said, doing very well. Another company uh, about the same age, uh, focusing on legal tech. Um, it um, also doing well, has many corporate customers. It sells to the uh, corporate, uh, to, to the legal department, corporate, and corporate. And a ton of uh, work uh, uh, is, a ton of time is spent in these companies on looking at very mundane legal uh, documents and responding to them, uh, verifying them, and so on. And um, what these folks uh, focus on is automating uh, a lot of this um, uh, work, grunt work, and freeing up the organization to focus on the more strategic, higher-level uh, aspects of uh, uh, prosecuting the legal uh, aspects of the company. The Ellen Institute uh, for Artificial Intelligence, or AI2, in Israel uh, is uh, very different. It's a subsidiary of the Allen Institute in uh, Seattle, uh, Washington. It's not for profit. It's very much an academic activity, or it's uh, not for profit. And um, uh, yeah, what it does is just focuses in Israel exclusively on natural language, headed by two uh, very strong, very talented uh, NLP researchers, and uh, looking at from a fundamentally uh, sort of the areas listed there, sort of the self-serve information extraction. Uh, question answering, uh, understanding of question answering, looking at the elements in the text that aren't explicitly mentioned but are relevant to understanding the text and gamifying kind of the uh, text and gamifying kind of the uh, interaction with these systems. And um, I listed there a few aspects that come in in understanding just to give you a sense uh, for um, the sort of work they do in the paper they publish, um, but. They take a question, you ask a question, then decompose it to the more basic uh, components that make up the question, that are implicit in the question. And when you break it down, you can start now using information, information retrieval techniques to find the answers and then put them back together as the answer to the question. They have a data set of strategy questions that is available for anybody to use. And uh, they uh, create interesting language models and uh, in particular, the first one there means uh, references injecting symbolic reasoning into the language model, the neural language, and uh, that I think is a key area, and I'll get back to that. Um, you really, they uh, are very, very prolific, uh, many publications, and I encourage you to go and, and, and look at the output of uh, the work of this uh, important group. The last company I want to mention is, and I'll spend more time on it uh, because it's a company I'm involved with and I'm more familiar with it. It's AI21 Labs. It's about two years old. It was uh, founded by three people beside myself, uh, Ori Gorshin, who came from the famed 8200 uh, technology unit uh, of the, uh, in the uh, Israeli military, and Amon Shashua, who besides being a founder and CEO of Mobileye, now part of Intel, uh, is a renowned professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a, a well-known machine learning uh, researcher. And um, it's an unusual company. Um, it's, um, 
you know, it's, it's still about 30 people, uh, about two thirds of them came from the same AP 200 units and a quarter have PhDs and a quarter masters, very capable group. Most of what the company does is not public, but um, and in particular, the product that it's working on and that we will we'll, uh, we'll announce uh, before too long uh, is not public. But that, um, and in particular, the product that it's working on and that we will we'll, uh, we'll announce uh, before too long uh, is not public. But some information was uh, shared, and I want to speak about it because it goes back to where we ended up the discussion uh, about where natural language uh, is today in the world. So remember, I ended up saying that, uh, at least I believe that we're in the area of where natural language and neural, uh, sorry, where knowledge representation and neural nets uh, begin to meet. Um, let's look at uh, one of the leading language models, BERT, and it's a mass language model, and it uh, uh, speaks about, uh, so you give it a sentence such as, I ate a papaya, you hide the word papaya and you ask it to predict what might appear there. And it predicts uh, uh, a lot of words very reasonably. These are the blue words there, like a lot, sandwich, or chicken. It doesn't predict papaya, or not, not at all, or not with high probability, uh, depending on the model, um, because it's not very frequent in the text. And it will predict with high probability ridiculous things, like the things in the red. I, I ate a movie. Um, and the point is, these are not rare occurrences, they're common. And it goes back to semantics. Bert doesn't know that what you eat is food and the papaya is a food. So what do you do about it? And this is something that uh, you need to address. And basically, you can go to, uh, you can you can go in one two ways. You can say that um, we just need bigger models, we need more data, more training time, so maybe not 175 billion uh, parameters, maybe uh, you know, 10 trillion parameters, uh, and maybe not $10 million budget for training, but 100 million, but eventually it will get it. And I don't know that it's wrong, uh, but uh, the other bet is that it is wrong, or at least it won't work uh, on any time scale that's relevant to us. And um, this is the bet that, uh, this is something I believe, and it's the bet that uh, AI21 Lab is making. So let me give you two examples from uh, how uh, AI21 Labs uh, is approaching uh, helping uh, bring AI into the age of understanding, one from natural language understanding and one from language generation. If you look at BERT, the language model, it's a mass language model, and you feed it the sentence such as Dan cooked a B-A-S-S on the grill, and you mask the word bass, and you ask to predict what might appear there, and um, or you know ask for something else reasonable. Um, the thing is, the word BSSS uh, has uh, many meanings. For example, the bass player was exceptional in a very different sense. Uh, in general, words have uh, can have up to twenty different meanings, and the question is, uh, how can the system tell them apart? And this is where SenseBert came in. This is a uh, lexical kind of a, a language model where we add lexical semantics to BERT. And it predicts, for example, in the first sentence, not only that the word B-A-S-S -S would appear, but there would be a noun of type food versus here, where it would be a noun of type artifact, a physical object. And the way it does it is interesting. Uh, if what BERT does takes a mass language, uh, sorry, takes a sentence, masks one of the words, then feeds it, uh, encodes it in the vector and feeds it to the transformer. What SenseBERT does is the same, but uh, adds a secondary task. Uh, so it's a multitask learning environment. Then you learn the senses, senses as well. Uh, and here's, here's a neat trick. Um, What's great about BERT, it's self-supervised. You don't need to annotate data. It learns from the corpus itself. But the corpus doesn't give you the senses, so where would those come from? Here, what, the, what, what, what happens is you use uh, WordNet, which is this uh, external repository of word sense, senses, and use that for supervision. 
there are many details, of course, that need to kind of be covered here, and uh, but that's just not the time. Uh, you can read about it in a paper that was published uh, recently in the uh, Proceedings of the, the Conference on uh, of the Association for Computational Linguistics, uh, uh, of the Association for Computational Linguistics. Uh, you see that uh, since Bert uh, became the leader uh, of uh, the, the relevant task called Word in Context, it's not so much that uh, we believe in, 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 in those data sets, they tend to uh, invite uh, so text. It's not so much that uh, we believe in, 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 in those data sets, they tend to uh, invite uh, sort of overfitting and playing games. Uh, but more, more importantly, uh, it's just a demonstration that the approach works. This is just lexical semantics, a uh, very basic level of semantics. Of course, semantics take much more uh, volume when you uh, look at uh, things beyond words, but uh, I won't cover this here. What I'll do is speak a little bit about generation. Uh, GPT is great, as I said, but it does have limitations. And one problem is this. Um, imagine you had a car and you told it where to start, but you didn't tell it where to go. Uh, if you're lucky, it won't crash, in, cra crash into things, but where it would end up, who knows? And that's sort of what GPT does. Well, the natural solution is to give it a start and an end. Give it, for example, a beginning sentence and an ending sentence. In fact, you can even tell it how much uh, you want it to interpolate between the two. And um, still a big space of interpolations, many pathways connecting. So now you need to add some guidance in the form of uh, lexical semantics and discourse semantics. And then if you're lucky, you get something reasonable as a result. And this is how it, how it works. Um, this is an example I gave for, uh, for a year ago, so I'm just using the same example here. Um, uh, you have Sean was giving the talk at Itchkai, and then the purpose of the talk is to explain things and so on. And it uh, interpolates between the two uh, with, uh, in this case, something that actually works very well. So I was speaking about the presenter of the talk will discuss how AI can improve our lives at the end of the end. At the end. Uh, Sean will discuss how I can improve human health, develop medicine for Alzheimer's, and so on. A reasonable sort of generation. Uh, if you look at GPT-3 versus Heim, um, here again I took a sentence that you saw before, tech generation technologies today show the great sign of progress, etc. Uh, in the case of Heim, I, ended, I, end, I, I, I gave the ending sentence also. And I didn't cherry pick here, it's just what came up, but I have a caveat that these are all very stochastic systems, and when you play with it, you get all kinds of things. But in this case, what you get from GPT-3, it starts with reasonable things like, you know, however many ch challenges that were previously seen and so on, but then it starts speaking about graphical processors uh, and systems, which does make a lot of sense, where the processors uh, and systems, which does make a lot of sense, whereas uh, Heim um, stays on topic and uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, we, we put it out there. You can go to the website and play with it. It's a lot of fun. It's not a product. It's not ready for commercial use in any way. Uh, it speaks nonsense a lot of the time, but sometimes it does lay really nice stuff. And here's some examples. Uh, for example, this gentleman uh, fed it the first and last sentence of its book and got a synopsis that he felt was better than what he, we, he would have written himself, and so on. Um, you know, it's natural if you give it a beginning and an end to give it waypoints along the way, and this is called Heimke, and, um, and um, it's again a lot of fun to play with, and you can go and play with it yourself. It's really an interactive generation. You generate something, then you say, oh, I want this to be longer or shorter. I want this to be, you can you know, play with it in a very variety of ways. And uh, there's an example here where, uh, which actually is going to be published in a leading wine newsletter. Uh, you feed it the sentence when I was young, I like big wines. Then second sentence, at some point, I developed a taste for old world wine, like Bordeaux with the Burgundy. And then you tell it, oh, so then I drank only Burgundy. And then you said, oh, then I started to drink a wider variety. And, and you end with, now I have an equal mix. 
And it's amazingly with you play and so sort of tweak it a little bit, say, oh, I don't like this, make this bigger, just give, tweak it a little bit, say, oh, I don't like this, make this bigger, just give me another example. Uh, you end up with a story that the editors of that journal like very much and they publish. These are just two examples of what AI21 Labs is doing to bring meaning and control to language technologies. Again, um, you know, before too long, um, more details in particular the product will be released. That's really what I want to say. We covered um, we covered natural language in general and how I view it as coming into the third age where you're mixing uh, deep uh, statistics, deep uh, learning and uh, knowledge presentation, reasoning. Spoke a little bit about the landscape in Israel and then a few words about AI21 Labs. Thank you very much for your uh, attention and enjoy the conference.